Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Today I want to dig into something that affects most .NET developers right now, and that is nullable reference types. I've talked to some people, and they seem to be a little confused on how it works or why it's even there, especially when it's turned on by default in the current templates that you might be creating for new projects. So let's talk about why they are, where they are, and why they were added. Let's take a look. So we're going to start in a empty folder. We take a look at this, it has nothing in it. And I want to just start by creating a new console application. I'm going to create it in this folder and just call it nullability for now. And let's go ahead and open up this project in code. I'm going to add the debug and release and just open up program. So there's not a whole lot we're going to do here, but I am going to say using static system.console so we can just do right lines everywhere else, right? So we're starting from a blank slate. So the first thing I want to actually do is look at the CS proj. Because this is a new template, you're going to see that nullable is turned on here. We can actually just disable it if we want. We're going to actually start with it disabled so we can then turn it on later and understand why it was added. So many ways we're in an older version of C Sharp. And so we could still do stuff like X equals 15, right? And because of that, we can go ahead and write the X out. Right? Pretty simple stuff. And what's curious here is what the X is, right? Because we assigned 15, we're inferring that this is going to be an integer. And of course, we could simply say it's an integer by default. Nothing's new here. And this is an example of a value type. There's a whole discussion about value types on the stack versus reference types on the heap that there's many better other places to look at that. But we do have these two classes of objects. You could think about numbers as being value types and some other basic root types. And in the old days, you couldn't assign a value type a null because value types specifically aren't reference types. Reference types were the only ones that could have a null. And so to get around that, they added this operator to allow you to create a nullable version of that X, right? The question mark says it's either an int or it's a null. And in fact, this would be just as true to say nullable. This is the same as putting the question mark. In fact, when we look at it, IntelliSense is going to say it's still an int question mark, right? And so... Let's go ahead and write just a little tester. Let's write x is null, colon, not null, right? So we just have a little test we can run here if we were curious about whether this is null. And there's a few more things that are interesting here that may come up for you, is if I don't assign something here, what happens? We take that out, it's not going to be assigned a value because it has not been initialized. You'll actually see here where it says use of unassigned variable, and that's a problem. We could use the default keyword to say, just assign it whatever that value is. And so this value may be, for numbers, it's gonna be a zero. But we couldn't do this with reference types, right? Reference types have an innate ability to be null. They're either null or they have been allocated. So if I come here and say string, it's gonna immediately complain because you can't do nullable on objects before nullable reference type. This is intrinsically what they're adding with nullable reference types. And so if I say just a string, that works, or I could assign this null, right? Well, one of the problems is it's not clear from this that string is nullable. And so it became this problem in maintaining code, whether something was nullable, whether it needed to be null, whether you had to write a bunch of this sort of code to test for null, all of that was sort of in the cards there. So that it was less ambiguous, they introduced this idea of nullable. And one of the interesting things about nullable before we dig into it is you can actually opt into it at a file level. You can say nullable enable, and then use another nullable disable. So that only between these two pieces will nullability actually work. We're not gonna leave those there. This is useful when you want to slowly migrate your application to use nullable without having to go and fix it in absolutely every place. So if we go back to the CS proj and we just say enable now, it's going to support it in every file in this project. So you immediately know that we started to get an error here, right? It's not able to convert a null into a string because implicitly the reference types, unless you do something about them, can no longer hold null. You can think about this as being more composed because when we're looking at a variable, 
or finding out that additional information, whether you intended for it to be null or not null. And this really comes down to that idea of you specifying what you expect to happen. If I do this, let's just assign it a string, and I do if x is null, that this will never fire. Nothing will ever happen in here because intrinsically x can't be null, cannot be assigned null in any way. But if we have the string here, we can definitely do that. If x is null, then do something about it. And what's interesting here is we're starting to get this intelligence here of X may be null here. The code that's written here doesn't necessarily tell the compiler that this may or may not be null. So you'll see this state of whether it thinks a variable is going to be null at all. More usually, let's get rid of this for a minute. Let's go ahead and create a class I'll call user. And we've all done this. We have a D property and let's say a string name. And when I do this in a class, I immediately get an error that says, you've told me that string is not null, but you've never assigned to it. So this needs to be either assigned here for the default value or our constructor has to be assigned before the constructor is empty because we've told it name can't be null. It can be empty, but can't be null. And this is true for other types. So we should be able to now say user equals new some string and we get a user where we know that name is not going to be null but let's come down here and let's make it a string and get rid of that right we're going to make it nullable so that this could be it and now it's complaining because of course i don't have a constructor that matches that and if i try to say right line user.name that will continue to work because name is nullable and right line will take a null and it'll print a null but what if we really wanted to write the length of that line uh-oh, we're starting to get an error. And it's because name may not be null here. It's doing analysis. It's doing analysis by the compiler, by Rosalind, to figure out whether this should be null or not. And it doesn't know because we haven't done anything specific. But the fact if we say user.name equals Charlie, what happens here? The error goes away because it, in static analysis of this, it goes, well, you assign name here, and this is the next thing. I know it's not null, right? But if they can't infer that code, what you're going to get in most cases is name may be null here. So there's really three states that the compiler can figure out. This is null, this isn't null, and this middle state that causes you all the pain, which is name may be null here. What do we do about it? And there's an interesting operator here that you've probably been using in new projects, and that is that question mark operator. This essentially tells it, if the name is null, return the null, don't call this at all. And so the idea here is it's gonna shortcut because what could we have done before this operator, right? We could have said name is null, colon user.name.length, right? And notice that because we tested for null here, it's also knowing that this can't be null. But this syntax is ugly and, and people hate it. And that's why they really came up with this idea of being able to add a question mark here to say, shortcut this in case, right? And you're gonna see a lot of your code in there, but there's actually another operator that's more important for what we're doing that's gonna be commonly used. You might know because maybe this user was generated someplace that name isn't null, that you've done something where the name is not going to be null even though it's allowed to be null, like, to put that there. And so what you can do is put an exclamation point there. What does that do? It's telling the compiler, I know you think this might be null. I'm sure it's not null. And if you try to execute this and it is null, it's going to throw an exception, right? Because ultimately what we want to do is reduce the amount of exceptions in these cases. That's why you're using null and not null. This exclamation is called a null forgiving operator. And what that really means is you're telling the compiler, this is better. You're telling the compiler, I know. I don't have to write code so that you figure it out or give you an option to shortcut it because I know this is always going to be the case. So it does mean that question mark and exclamation point both get rid of this error, but the differences are very big. This is the name could be null and what should it do if it is null. This is trust me, the developer, I know this is never going to be null. And if it is null, we're in big trouble, throw the exception. So one of the other things that is interesting to me is that what if we made user a generic, right? And let's say what we want to actually say here is that T is a name, 
right? So let's come up here and say string and let's assign name equals hello, right? Here you're having that problem where it says, oh, this must contain a valid option for this. We're saying it's not null, but we want to be able to assign it. So this may be a case where we bring this back in and say, you know, you need to pass in whatever that type is and I'll assign it for you. All good, but not really what we want. So here I can just replace setting it here and whatever goes in this constructor is gonna be whatever the type is here. If I was gonna put int here, then this would need to be one, right? It's generic and that should continue to work. But what if you don't wanna deal with nullability? Cause you could certainly here say, you gave me a type and I wanna make sure it's nullable. So I'm gonna use it here. And that works fine, except you might want to limit it, right? In this case, without the question mark there, our type could be the nullable type. This is still gonna work in the same way, except that name is going to be a string question mark, a nullable. But often you don't want nullable in the type. You wanna be able to control whether this is nullable or not by including it in the class structure using the generics. And so this is where you can use not null for the T. This limit says, I'm gonna expect it not to be a nullable version of that reference or value type because I'm gonna use it as a null Therefore, if I try to put a string question mark there, what's gonna happen? It's gonna say, you can't because generic type must be not null. And so why you can turn this off or disable it in nullability, I would try to avoid that. Get comfortable with using nullability and when you see your new or old project compile with these 800, 2000 warnings about it, you can still use this declaration to turn on and off nullability in part of your project. This is a uh, common to turn it off in the cases of where you're just creating model classes if you don't want to deal with the nullability and just assume everything's going to be a nullable type without having to have a constructor to assign them and all that. But also if you're moving your code in, being able to take this by turning on nullable in certain pieces of code, new code or code that's being modified and changed in order to opt into it, I think is a, a good solution. And in that case, you would want to turn it off in nullability. So what do I think the C Sharp team was thinking? Using nullable reference types has been sort of hinted at for a while now. It was an experimental feature and then it was non-default. It wasn't in the templates and then now it's in the templates to get people used to using it because the code ends up being more defensible and maintainable by understanding whether null is a valid object and not just saying, you know, most of what we create in strings and classes and types that they are going to support or not to support null means that we're going to have less confusion and less code that's just checking for null just in case it happens. So thanks for joining me. I hope you learned something in this episode. If you wouldn't mind liking and or subscribing, they're both free. It really helps us get the word out about this channel and hopefully this sort of content will keep you coming back. My name is Sean Wildermuth. This has been Coding Shorts. Coding Shorts.